It was 40 years ago on November 10th when John Gaines had his dream come true. The 1984 Breeders' Cup was one day with seven races worth $10 million at, ah, remember, Hollywood Park. The 2024 Breeders' Cup will be two days with 14 races worth $33 million here at Del Mar, highlighted by the $7 million classic featuring City of Troy from Ireland, Forever Young from Japan, and Fierceness from America, and maybe somebody else that we will talk about a little later. We will preview all the races in this eighth annual Hardcore Handicappers preview of the Breeders' Cup on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. I am at Del Mar. Trust me, that's that's a phony background, but I actually shot the photo out the press box window. It just looked better than, you know... Uh, yeah, now I'm getting in the weeds. Let's get into the handicapping. <laughs> let's start off with a uh, man who, uh, let's see now. You want to do a little bragging on yourself, Ed DeRosi? It seems to me that you did pretty well on a, a Breeders' Cup in, say, about uh, what, 12 months ago, just up the road at Santa Anita. Of course, he of the fair odds at horse racing nation, Ed DeRosa. Yeah, it's been a much better run in Breeders' Cups than it has been in Triple Crowns. So. Uh I'm happy to say, uh, sight of my worst beat ever is at Del Mar. So I'm looking to exercise some demons this year and keep the good times rolling in the Breeders Cup. And as we'll discuss shortly, I'm against a lot of favorites. So, uh, you know, could be one of those weekends. I, I hate to prolong things here, but do you want to drop the other shoe on your bad beat? Uh, Dunbar Road was one of the biggest bets I've ever made in my life. So that that ripped my heart out. Okay, I, I hate to tell you this. I actually won uh, off of that race going <laughs> well, the other that, way. That's well, the beauty of paramutual. Someone, <laughs> If I'm losing, someone's winning. Yeah, well, let's see if we can find a winner also <laughs> from uh, the man who's done a lot of AI work here recently at Horse Racing Nation, the boss, Mark Midland. Uh, you got AI at work for you today, or is it just your noggin? Um, I'm not as much as usual because they just drew late last night, so sometimes it takes time for everything to kind of flow through. Uh, but I've got some early AI odds. Um, it's a little tough on the Europeans, so it takes a little bit more time to get that data and the, the all the international shippers. But yeah. uh, um, I mean, just what a great two days of racing, uh, great cards, and uh, you know the classic fourteen horses. We haven't had a classic, I think, you know, this wide open in a long time, and uh, it's just a great betting race and great two days of betting. I, I'm, I'm hearing a little hint that it might not have been one of the three I mentioned that Mark will <laughs> talk about a little later. And now from uh, Las Vegas, I guess he's in Las Vegas. I know he's sometimes in Saratoga. He's sometimes here in the San Diego area. Uh, but that looks like his digs behind him in Nevada. Uh, he is from DK Horse, the sports book director at DraftKings, Johnny Avello. I know. I mean, uh, uh, I've known you a long time, Johnny. I, this has got to be right in your wheelhouse. Well, uh, I am in the office um, for another couple of days, but I'll be heading your way. Uh, I'm really excited to be down there on a couple of cool days. Uh, win or lose, I'm going to try my hardest to win. I mean, I love the the pool sizes. I mean, there's nothing better to shoot for than in betting at the Breeders' Cup. Uh, but I'm going to have a good time. Regardless, uh, Breeders' Cup is a special time. It is that, and uh, it's something that we look forward to. This podcast is something I know you look forward to. The numbers tell us that. And if you're listening to this as a podcast, after midday, Wednesday-ish, it depends on the size of the file and the upload, but you can find this episode in video form on the Horse Racing Nation YouTube page. So if you're getting right down to the nitty-gritty right before, say, let's say Thursday, it should be up by then. And if you found us on YouTube, this is your invitation to check out the weekly episodes of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. They drop every Friday normally, and I add pop-ups like these to handicap big races like the Triple Crown and the Breeders' Cup. So subscribe free at Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you find podcasts, or check it out in the podcast section at horseracingnation.com. Coming up, we analyze the five races Friday for two-year-olds, including the juvenile, which should or could produce the early favorite for Kentucky Derby 151. But let's get you ready for the Breeders' Cup with our guys who are going to tell us what's happening at picks.horseracingnation.com. 
Com. Mark, is it uh, you who is leading off on this one? Yeah, I'm glad to lead off and uh, just wanted to talk about the Breeders' Cup Super Screener. And uh, Mike Shuddy puts that together every year. Um, just amazing effort. All the details, all the information that goes into it. And uh, he does an awesome job of, um, you know, really creating patterns and criteria for what it takes to win every race, but also for what uh, what it takes if it's a European import, what it takes if it's, a you know, working on the Japanese profile, what's, what's it take for these different shippers. So, you know, these races are just kind of outliers. Then if you think about, you know, grade ones during the year, so many of them are seven horse, eight horse fields with two or three contenders. Now we've got 10, 12, 14 horses with eight or 10 contenders. And so you need to kind of get something to get, cut through all the noise, look at the profiles. There's a different profile for each of these Breeders' Cup races. And uh, it's just done a, a whale of a job. I couldn't think about doing the Breeders' Cup without it. And just to, we'll talk about it in a second, but the juvenile turf sprint coming up, um, it's just dominated by Europeans. And uh, they've swept the trifecta in the last two renewals. So, you know, we'll talk about that in a second. But that's the kind of information that, how can you play these races without it? So the Breeders' Cup Super Screener, it's invaluable. Find it at pickstophorseracingnation.com. Indeed. And when you go there, upper left, you'll find the everything package for the Breeders' Cup. You get the whole package for the two most jam-packed days of big-time racing. Costs you only $97. Costs you a lot more than that if you went a la carte. And it contains a lot of the tools that either you have come to love at Horse Racing Nation or you will. So go to the upper left when you go to picks.horseracingnation.com. Click where it says Breeders' Cup Super Screener. The everything package is available for you now at Picks. P-I-C-K-S. Picks.horseracingnation.com. This is the Hardcore Handicappers episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod with Mark Midland, Johnny Avello, and Ed DeRosa. I am the aforementioned racing pod. And so let's get to Friday's races, the five two-year-old championships on the Breeders' Cup card. Partly sunny, says the National Weather Service, 64 degrees. This is the cool we're talking about. So it's been a little bit cool here for this part of the nation. And so we'll look forward to what will be a very comfortable day on Friday here at Del Mar. Let's start off with the race at 545 Eastern Time. It's the $1 million Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Mark was just talking about it. Five furlongs on the turf. These two-year-olds, number 12 in the entries, at least the main entry. And the main field is augmented by two also eligibles. Ekaro Sieg comes from Japan with a two-for-two two record, winning by open lengths in a pair of six furlong races. That's your seven-to-two morning line favorite. Let's start off the analysis with Johnny Avello. Um. The horse that I, I tell you, first of all, let me just tell you, if there's a, a wide open race that I've ever seen in my life, this is it. I mean, this thing, you could almost point to almost any, almost any horse. There's a couple in there that I would say no, but almost any horse. And they all should be basically the same odds. So uh, I landed on uh, uh, Asterius. Um, that's, uh, I'm going to use Asterius and I'm, I'm not going to bet this uh, horse to win i'm just going to use this horse in some exotics uh i like this horse is coming in with a couple of wins really nice record here in 24 especially as of late uh i will be using asterius with big mojo who is very similar to asterius arizona blaze will be my bigger price horse who's 15 to 1 and uh uh ikoro c will be the other that i use in there um and I may go whistle jacket too. So those are uh, hit by my top horse first and second. I'll use the others sprinkled in. Asterius is the number two horse. Johnny is keying trained by Archie Watson based in England. James Doyle will be riding Mark. Yeah, I'm with Johnny on the, you know, head scratching part. This is wide open and it, you know, it's so hard to have a lot of good information on, on these. Uh, as I said, super screener says, you know, the, the Europeans have swept the trifecta the last couple of years. So I think that's where you want to start your little, you know, your search. Um, I landed on big mojo. Um, that was a good play here, but uh, I couldn't go against any recommending it against anybody going for a bigger price um, in a wide open race like this. Ed, how about you? 
I'm, I'm going to actually punt a little bit in so much as if either 13 or 14 draw in, they would be my pick. Uh, I think it's a travesty that the local prep uh, had neither of the top two finishers drawn to the body of the field. Uh, both fit. So, you know, whether it's 13 or 14, I, I would use. Uh, I thought the speakeasy was a good race and they were close to each other and have a good style. And uh, we haven't mentioned that we have some PPs available for free at Horse Racing Nation, thanks to Brisnet. And looking at those PPs for the Juvenile Turf Sprint, uh, at uh, Del Mar, the outside post going five furlongs is not bad. It's fine. Um, you can be on the far outside and make some noise. And in fact, it's actually much better than the rail. So if 13 or 14 draw in, that's where I'm going. Otherwise, uh, I would say I have a lean toward Whistle Jacket. Aiden thought enough of uh, him to start at Royal Ascot. Uh, it's had a, a decently long campaign, but Aiden's been here before with these types. That would be my top pick uh, if 13 or 14 don't try him. 13 is Pally Kitten, trained by Doug O'Neill. Todd Fincher has the 14 smash it. So if you hear any, either of those names drawing in, that's where Ed will be leaning. I like Ides of March, speaking of drawn to the outside. Aiden O'Brien, is this the other Aiden? Eight to one. <laughs> One, two in a row. And, and and look at all those italicized names in terms of the races that he's been involved in, meaning next out winners. So uh, at least I'm going to take a flyer there. Frankie DeTore, if he wins, would, of course, take a flyer on his own. Let's get to the next at 625 Eastern time. And that is the $2 million Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies. This will be the first of the Breeders' Cup races on the main track here at Del Mar. A mile and a 16th, thus two turns. Scottish Lassie in this field of 10 was a maiden breaking nine length winner on October 5th in the one mile Frisette, a grade one race. And that is your five to two morning line favorite, Mark. Yeah, I like Scottish Lassie a bit. Um, I thought a lot of these were kind of similar and, uh, you know, wasn't really sold on any of them. So, you know, this is a place where I might take uh, the Japan shipper and take American bikini uh you know some very fast races in japan and uh see what happens so kind of taking a shot here didn't see a whole lot of difference between uh scottish lassie immersive um non-compliant from baffert um like quick kick a little bit for tom amos maybe to get in there in a price but uh let's take a shot and go overseas off to overseas with Mark looking at American Bikini by American Pharaoh. Takashi Saito is the trainer, and Ryan Moore will be in to ride. Uh, of course, mostly riding for Aiden O'Brien's horses, but picking up the ride here in the juvenile fillies. Ed, what about you? Yeah, I'm extremely bullish on American Bikini. Uh, the brisnet power for this race is 94, and none of the uh, American based fillies have run that number yet. Uh, no one has run par. And I have to think, based on what we've seen uh, from this one in Japan, uh, one to two in in her second start, that she's capable of running par. I think she's going to be the favorite. I mean, Mark and I have already talked about her. I'm not excited by either of the choices who are ahead of her in the morning line. Uh, but she's going to be a single for me in the multi-race wagers. And I will try to spice up the exotics with vodka with the twist. Uh, who did just miss in the Del Mar debutante last out. We haven't really seen Thousand Words uh, routing much yet as a freshman sire, but I am intrigued with the rail, Harad Ortiz up. Uh, so the Uno is going to be one I try to sneak in there with who I think will be the favorite American bikini. Johnny, what about you? Uh, I'm, I'm settled. I settled on immersive. Um, these two-year-olds do get better. Yeah, you know, only a couple of races for these horses. Uh, so they continue to improve every race. Uh, Immersive's last two races, uh, the one at Saratoga, the spin away, um, and, and a race at Keeneland were kind of equal. So I look for her to move up after that race. So uh, she'll be my top pick. I'll use some of the horses the guys mentioned, like Vaca with a twist in the exact is quick kick also and non-compliant. I would like Immersive more if I didn't see three to one sitting there right next to the name. But uh, I also like Bob Baffert getting a 15 to one shot here at his home track. And that would be Nooney, who is certainly underperformed in her last two races after looking like a, a pretty good deal coming through the summer here with the Sorrento win, but we'll see what kind of numbers we look at. But I think the tote board 
is going to be worth a look or two on this race. Let's get to 7.05 Eastern time for the $1 million Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf. This will be a mile. Uh, it's a mile that means two turns here on the very tight track on the infield here at Del Mar. Lake Victoria at 8-5 to five tries to run her record to 5-5 five for five for Coolmore and for Aiden O'Brien. This is a Frankel filly who has had two Group 1 victories 13 days apart last month. This will be her first time, though, going longer than seven furlongs. Ed, would you buy or sell a horse like that who raced twice in 13 days this past month and then comes back for this and will be stretching out for the first time? Yeah, tall order, but I'm buying. I, I actually would say she is the most likely winner of, of any Breeders' Cup race. I, I think mm. this is a total superstar. Uh, I'm, I mean, to the point... I'm actually like surprised that we get to see her as a two-year-old. Uh, I mean, this is classic minded. The pedigree is just insane. Of course, the connections are well known. Uh, total single for me. Uh, there is a, I believe a $3 all turf pick three, which has become popular. Uh, I'm definitely going to be spreading in that juvenile turf sprint. So happy to hang my hat here. Anything over even money is value. Lake Victoria, if she loses, I'm I'm out of everything. Hmm. All right, Johnny, he's rolling the dice. What about you? I'm buying. I'm buying in. Yep. Uh, you know, when I look at her numbers, she's she's better than any of by at least two or three points better than any other horse in this race. Um, I will use some others though underneath her. I'll use uh I'll use Heaven's Gate, Thought Process, uh May Day Ready. A, long shot in the race and Vixen also a long shot. So I'll try to uh, make that a little bit better price than uh, even money. As that says, <clears throat> if she goes off that low. Yeah. I like 12 and 13 underneath too, Johnny. So we, we see this race very similarly. Okay. Mark, what about you? Yeah. I'll add to the 12 and 13 underneath. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, I didn't see a lot of speed in this race. And so I'm looking and we've got Aiden O'Brien, with an undefeated Philly on the inside where there's not speed and Ryan Moore's up. It's like, wow, there's, there's, how, how do you go against this horse? So uh, I'm with the guys and uh, I don't know if it's the most likely winner out of the 14 races, but I uh, thought Lake Victoria looked good here. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you guys on Lake Victoria. I'm going to agree with two of you on May Day Ready coming in. Three for three for Joe Lee with Frankie up and 20 to one on the morning line. I got to have a sprinkle on that action in this race. The $2 million Breeders' Cup Juvenile this annually would be the race that will uh, tell us that uh, here's your Kentucky Derby favorite. Now, some of the things we've seen with the Kentucky Derby future wager might suggest otherwise. And we'll find out how that plays out this weekend concurrently, in fact with the Breeders' Cup. A mile and a 16th, so two turns for these two-year-olds at 745 Eastern here at Del Mar. Ten of them are entered. The Godolphin Homebred East Avenue is two for two. Looks so impressive adding a second turn, winning by five and a quarter lengths in the mile and a 16th Breeders' Futurity, the grade one this month at Keeneland. You got Chancellor McPatrick, though, who's three for three. Three to one, second choice behind East Avenue at five to two in the program. Chancer is trained by Chad Brown. Grade one wins in the hopeful and the champagne, but this is the first time going two turns. And we've seen that Bronco buck a few of these juveniles <laughs> coming into this race in past years. Johnny, what do you think about the BC juvenile? Yeah, there's to me, there's a bunch of horses in here that are good. Uh, there's three that stand out, and then there's two that stand out out of those three to me. Uh, East Avenue is a really good horse. Uh, certainly nothing done, nothing wrong in her two, uh, in his two. Uh, Chancellor McPatrick is kind of where I landed here. Uh, I like all three of his races, especially the last two, and I think he'll move up off of that. And I also like Jonathan's Way. Uh, Jonathan's Way as can also move up off of his two races. I expect to be, for him to be in the mix. And then there's a whole bunch of other horses you could use in here, but those are the three standouts to me. I, uh, but Chancellor Mc, McPatrick, I think is best of the three. Ed. I agree. Uh, I love hearing all the buzz on East Avenue. I hope he actually is favored. 
Uh, obviously, a lot of talk about how the Del Mar main track plays, and maybe we'll get some clues. Nine races Thursday and several on uh, Friday before this. But there is speed in here. The Baffer pair is going to go. Ferocious likes to be on the front end. And I just think Chancellor McPatrick is is better than East Avenue and we're going to get a better price and there is some speed to close into. So yeah, yeah. Strong lean on Chancellor McPatrick. And then I'm going to try Jonathan's way even to, to be East Avenue underneath, but strong lean Chancellor McPatrick on top. Mark. Yeah, this is tough. Um, like the guy said, there's a lot of speed in here. Um, I just don't know about the the, the track profile playing for uh, Chancey McPatrick to come way off it. And Chad Brown's already, you know, he's laid out plenty of excuses about how this track profile on the dirt may work against him. We've, you know, every time it seems like he can talk about this race. So um, I, I do think his concerns are valid. Um, I think this could end up being a little bit of a rider's race. You know, we've got, um, I read Ortiz on gaming, one of the Bafferts. Uh, certainly I think, you know, Baffert probably doesn't send both. Um, so that might be one that could sit off it a little bit. Jonathan's way with Rosario up. He's come off at sprinting. He went to the lead at one turn. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if he tried to come off it a little bit. So I'm going to look at those two to try to beat East Avenue. Um, I think, you know, and then there's the possibility East Avenue just goes and is just too good for these. But, um, with all the speed in here, I think you, it's a good opportunity to take a shot against East Avenue. My eyes told me East Avenue was the goods going two turns when I saw him at Keeneland, but uh, my experience tells me not to ignore a Baffert <laughs> in this race who's two for two. So I'll look at East Avenue and gaming in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. That brings us to the finale of the Breeders' Cup races on Friday, and that is the Million Dollar Juvenile Turf. It is a two-turn mile. At 8.25 Eastern time, 14 are in the main body of the draw with two also eligibles. New Century, based in Eng uh, uh, in England, yes, uh, in England, has a North America victory to his credit. Andrew Balding trained by Kamiko, won the summer stakes, a grade one going a mile last month at Woodbine. This is the 5-2 to two morning line favorite ed what do you think about the juvenile turf and real quick a piggyback on your baffert comment he is the only trainer to win a two-turn race at a del mar breeders cup turf or dirt uh west coast based west coast so, based okay. yeah he he uh he's the one who, who likes the local cooking routing uh but we're going to go international for this one uh i'm i'm going to play the race to turn the tables on the summer uh i thought that was a Pretty even effort from both. Uh, New Century certainly got the dub, but uh, L is it Kudra? You think? Number well, four, Al Kudra. Al Kudra. Al Kudra. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know he was even money, and just New Century got the jump, and there was some bumping. Uh, they both were wide. It was a fast pace. So to me, they ran pretty similarly. Now you get the longer price on Al Kudra, and I'm going to take it. But the summer stakes absolutely the key to this race. Okay. Mark, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I agree completely with Ed. Uh, the summer stakes is the key here. And I think you could even just kind of flip them all. So New Century being the winner, maybe uh, play him third of the three. Al Kudra play him uh, on as your top choice. And then Dream On, who kind of did all the dirty work or, or got involved in, in a lot of the pace and then just kind of faded to third at the end. Uh, gets a nice post here with Jose Ortiz. I think he'd be a player. Certainly for the trifecta, maybe even hold on for second. And then, uh, you know, this is one of these, you know, races that could blow up a little bit in your trifecta. Uh, the eight, I like Miner Minaret Station, uh, 38 to one, uh, hmm. won the bourbon at Keeneland. Um, you know, this is a horse you're going to want to have in your trifecta. Uh, if, you know, running third, maybe even dabble in second. And uh, if you're playing super effective, definitely include this horse. Yeah, I, I'm with, I'm when you said that, Mark, from your lips to God's ears, William Walden, who's Elliot's son, trains and Christian Torres will be up. But yeah, talk about blowing up the tote board in the bourbon at Keeneland uh, earlier in the month. Johnny, what about you? Yeah, I like El Kudra, too. So we're all looking at that race pretty much the same. Uh, I'll also look for uh, some other horses to use Zulu, Zulu Kingdom. Uh, trade by Ch Chad Brown. Um, 
can't certainly can't ignore New Century, but you're not going to get a price if that's going to be the two horses you use. So I'll probably find something else by by the time it's race time. And by the time this race is done, we'll be looking ahead <laughs> to Saturday, licking our wounds or counting our fortune, whichever it may be here after day one of the Breeders' Cup. Coming up, we check out Saturday's nine Breeders' Cup races, including the $7 million Classic. But right now, Johnny, I want to invite you to tell us what we should check out with DK Horse. Well, thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, um, we're, we're doing really well. Uh, sometime this upcoming year, we'll uh, have everything on the DK platform, so you won't have to go to DK Horse separately. Uh, but as of now, that's still the way it is. And we have some big plans and I don't want to reveal too much right now, but once we do that integration, um, they'll, you'll see some new things from DK Horse. Right now we're running some specials for, for the Breeders' Cup, uh, sign up bonus, deposit 250, get 250. Uh, each race, the, the two big races of the, uh, Saturday, the, the uh, Breeders' Cup Classic, this staff, if you bet uh, one race, if you bet 100, you get a $20 bonus. The other, if you bet 80, you get a $20 bonus. Plus, we have specials going all day long on each and every race. So, as in DraftKings fashion, we continue to load up those promotions. By the way, he has fierceness at even money in a couple jurisdictions to be horse of the year. What What are the jurisdictions you have horse of the year betting, Johnny? Uh, to Torpedo Ann is even money. Uh, fierceness is three to one. Pardon me. See, look at that. I was I, I thought I was going to load up and pour money in on fierceness. And Those two number. jurisdictions are um, Arizona and Ontario, Canada. Okay. And you know, and you'll say, huh, why only those two? Well, they're the only two that accepted it right now. But by next year, we'll have more time to put this up. We'll get it up a little bit earlier, and uh, hopefully, more jurisdictions will jump on board. Excellent. But as far as DK Horse is concerned, it's an app you want to have on your phone or your tablet, whatever your handheld is. Look for it where you get your apps. Look for DK Horse. It's brought to you by the folks who bring you DraftKings. Wait, can we can we get down on that? Because the three of us have a vote, right? <laughs> Four of well, us? Two. Oh, I gave up my vote. You gave up your vote. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Even that might be beyond my... Uh comfort level <laughs> guys would you agree well, we won't touch on this too long but would you agree if torpedo anna wins uh and and fierceness wins probably fierceness is horse of the year if yes. fierceness, if torpedo wins and fierceness doesn't she, she's horse of the year yeah i think that's how it would shake out now if both of them lose and the uh and aspison's uh sprinter comes through it could be yes. a whole different burn. Yeah, depends on burn. depends on what they lose by, right? Depends the loss of, you know, how how big will the loss be? I think that's a matter also. Quality wins, quality losses. This sounds like we're doing college football and basketball here. <laughs> but good stuff to look forward to at DK Horse. It's Saturday for the Breeders' Cup that we're looking at now here on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod, the pop up handicappers. As the hardcore crew gets uh, rolling now with nine races, so let's dig in on this. I should tell you that the National Weather Service is telling us there is a chance of showers after 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern, here at Del Mar on Saturday. Now, you know, as Bob Baffert would say, it would just tighten the track if it's just a slight chance of showers. So we'll see about that and watch as the week goes on. 63 degrees is the forecast high on Saturday. The Million Dollar Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Sprint will be bright and early noon here, 3 o'clock in the east, 7 furlongs, 4 fillies and mares, 3 and up. 10 of them are entered in this first of the Saturday championships. 3-year-old Ways and Means at 5-2 to two has won her last three races for Chad Brown. Steve Asmussen has had 5-year-old Society training up to this race for 10 weeks since winning the ballerina at Saratoga. This is a theme we've seen with various trainers, and it's happening more often now than it had in recent years. So we put this into the morning line. We see ways and means at 5-2, to two, Society at 3-1, to one, and Mark Midland trying to distill it all. Yeah, I, I like Bob up here. Um, thought she was kind of the, been the best uh, sprinter all year. 
Uh, Society got the best of her last time in the ballerina at Saratoga. There just maybe wasn't that much pace, and the track was paying, I think, a little bit more towards speed. But um, it's a little unclear who the pace could be to go with Society here, but I'm still going to go with Baja. Uh, I think Society is going to be a factor. But uh, And then I really like Scylla. I really like this horse. You know, I'm not sure how much the seven furlongs is her game, but uh, I like her a lot from – from, I think she's been tough as nails all year. So I'm going to, you know, to play an exact with Vaha or Vercilla. And, uh, you know, we'll see if society gets in there. Okay. Vava, the number four for Cherie DeVoe, who's certainly on the climb as a trainer. And so uh, we'll see how that works out for Mark. What's it going to be for you, Johnny? Well, it's going to be society for me. Um, you know, she, she runs in the sprint last year. She runs four to uh, Goodnight Olive. And runs a hell of a race, but uh, Good Night Olive is just too good. And then she comes back off the layoff. They just put her through pretty much what I would call just a grade. It was a grade three, and didn't push her too much. And then she comes out smoking. I think she comes out smoking with with both barrels now. So <laughs> um, society's the horse for me. Uh, I could see others. I'll use uh, Scylla for sure. Ways and means possibly. Uh, and Pleasant's an outsider for me. That's a horse I think's moving up where I could get a maybe a better price on uh, for Pleasant to complete that exact. Ed? I love Pleasant. Uh, I mentioned Baffert's the only West Coast based trainer with a two turn dirt win- or two turn either surface Breeders Cup win at Delmar. The other California based horses to win Breeders Cup races there were sprinters. Uh, so this this field fits that dynamic. I think she's fast. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll learn a lot more about her in this spot. Or not only her grade one debut, but stakes debut. But the numbers are there. Uh, she's fast enough. Uh, I'm excited to get a. You know, it's one of those. If she wins this, you'll never see this price again ever. Uh, and my note on Silla would be, you know, far be it for me to tell Hall of Fame trainer uh, Bill Mott. I'm shocked this horse isn't in the distaff. Uh, I probably would have picked her in the distaff to upset yeah. Torpedo Anna. That's a good point. I, I don't like her here. Um, the outside didn't help either. Uh, after Pleasant, the the logicals that we've all discussed make sense. So I'm going to try to upset it on top with Pleasant. I'm going to do just the opposite. I think this might be a single for me with ways and means. So we'll uh, we'll see how that goes for me as I nah, do that. She- and by the way, this is the beginning of a pick five. There's there's two pick fives, and the classic is going to be the the swing race, or it's going to be the anchor race on the first one, and the first race on the second one. So that's uh, for for all the grinding on. And I get it about the classic not being the climactic race. It could be an interesting pivot point for the two pick fives. Is the way this thing is going to work out. Any other thoughts on this? I I, I kind of got the feeling there's still some <laughs> bullets in the chamber on this race. I think no? so. Interesting. Nah. Thing. it's getting that horse is getting a little bit better um the uh yeah i don't know it's a tough it, it's a tough race i don't know i mean i think pleasant's really going to be up against it against these are really good grade one horses but i see what you're where you're going with it okay all right now speaking of tough I, i'm going to be interested to hear uh all of us try to butcher the name of the number 10 in the next race although i've done my homework on it <laughs> Uh, This is the Million Dollar Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. It's five furlongs for three-year-olds and up at 341 Eastern time, 12 in the main body, three also eligibles. We talked about Cogburn. Uh, I did a feature on Cogburn and talked to Steve Asmussen for last week's podcast. Uh, I mean, there's every reason to be high on this horse, a world record for five and a half furlongs that was set at Saratoga uh, under a minute running that. Uh, championship credentials, certainly having won all his starts this year in the turf sprint at Churchill Downs, the Jiper at Saratoga with that world record time and the turf sprint at Kentucky Downs. And this is the one I think, look, you can put this horse in conversation for horse of the year, maybe not winning it under the circumstances we have already described with Torpedo, Anna and Fierceness, but conversation is conversation and seven to five odds make this the morning line favorite ed what do you think about the turf sprint and uh what do you think about trying to pronounce the name of the number 10 <laughs> i should know because i was there when uh he made his debut uh north american debut at colonial uh i'll just call him number 10 uh is yeah 
you've done your homework. I'll wait to hear you say it. Uh, I want to hear everybody butcher it. I, <laughs> so. Is Vanga Vugu? You're close. You're very, very close. Uh, I mean, Cogburn, I was bearish. Uh, you know, a few hours ago, I tweeted he was one of the morning line favorites I'm against. And then I, I hardcored it up for this podcast. And it was a rare instance. Usually I dig in when I know I want to beat a favorite and find all these reasons more than I'm against. And the more I looked at the race, the more I was like, holy cow, how does this horse lose? So he's really tough. But I, I will say that the deuce, uh, Matorius, caught my eye a little bit. Uh, you know, has a win, has three wins at Del Mar, including, I guess you could say, the prep for this. But the, the equivalent at the Del Mar summer meeting came from way out of it, drawn inside. So it's going to have to save ground and make one run. But wouldn't shock me if they go fast early. But uh once i was against cogburn but i've come around he's he's pretty special johnny cogburn is pretty special uh it's not like he's coming in this race going backwards he's going forward so it's a great point it's gonna be really tough to beat. uh now izu fungu fungu let me tell you what that sounds like to me ronnie that sounds like an italian profanity <laughs> so uh, and that's what you i'm sure that's what you wanted to hear um <laughs> And I may you and I will may use that horse because I do like this horse a little bit. Uh, I do like this horse underneath. A couple others, I a, a G Bullet, I also like underneath. And then uh, uh, on the on the bottom there, I like uh, one other horse. That's Brad Cell underneath. So um, that's the way I'll probably play it. Yeah, Mark, uh, Brad Cell's the one. Certainly is the goods from overseas. When I had Nick Luck on the podcast, he said, "Listen." Don't be so enamored of Cogburn that you look past Bradsill. So, in a way, this is a collision at the summit for these two. What do you think? Yeah, I'm going to stick with Cogburn here. You know, he's just uh, he just looks so good, and uh, I like the the prep race and and coming into this. And uh, you know, I don't see that much pace in here, so I think he's going to be in a good spot. He can take over when he wants, and. Uh, um, so I'm going to probably be looking more at the exactas. I think, you know, Matorius is a good one. Um, like Ed said, he's three for three over the course. And Matorius owes me. He owes, owes me and a few others the uh, the pick six to Mage because he let no balls beat him at 35 to one, which was unfortunate. Um, so maybe he can come through as an upset or or an exacta play. Uh, and Howard Wolowitz, I thought was a... a a, a, you know, he got a pace set up at, at Kentucky Downs, but uh, really came roaring off the pace and uh, ran really well that day. So I think that might be a nice exact play as well. Just remember with Howard Wallowitz, the whole universe, Mark, was in a hot, dense state that <laughs> nearly 14 million years ago expansion started. Wait. Uh, a little inside thing here. Barbara Borden, the chief steward in Kentucky, Whenever she and I see each other, we recite the theme to Big Bang Theory. <laughs> Isn't that just special? By the way, Barbara, Barbara, get well. She she has a leg cast on now, walking with a cane. Uh, you know, Keeneland's going to do that to you. Uh, all right. So, a lot of uh, steps. what's that? A lot of steps. A lot of steps. No doubt about it. Uphill and down. Uh, I love Cogburn in this one. And I also like the horse. Oh, uh, uh, Mark, did, did you say the name yet? Number 10. Uh, is it Vungu Vungu? Say it again. I think you got it. Say it again. Is it Vungu Vungu? You nailed oh, it. it. Is he Vungu Vungu? Is he Vungu Vungu? I looked it up. Uh, it is a Zulu word meaning windstorm. So there you go. From South <laughs> Africa, six year old gelding. So I like. And on Friday, we have Zulu Kingdom. Uh, the, yes, you do. So there. So there. But this is a South Africa horse. So I think, what are we, uh, did I hear five continents are represented here? At the Breeders' Cup this time around, I guess uh, who are the two that aren't? Uh, Australia has a Australia jockey. Australia and Antarctica, but it's Australia has a jockey here, so uh, yeah. And nobody came from the McMurdo yeah, that's a Classic. Hmm? Yeah, that, that, they're represented with the they're jockey. Represented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But nobody yeah. came out of the McMurdo Stakes near the South Pole. So, so Ronnie Trevor should have no problem pronouncing that, should he? Well, he shouldn't because he's not here. It's Larry Colmus this time of year. Oh, it is. Oh, I didn't but, realize that. Yeah, okay. no, he does the fall. So. No, Tre Trevor will be back in Minnesota not having any problem with it. Let's get 
to the next, and that's the distaff, $2 million Breeders' Cup distaff, a mile and an eighth, Phillies and Mares, three and up, 421 Eastern time, 10 are in the field, not 11. And it's the 11th who's not, idiomatic, that changed everything when he came out of the race with that minor but poorly timed knee injury. She came out of the race, pardon me. So she's mm-hmm. retired into uh, the breeding shed. Torpedo Anna, four to five. Heavy, 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 heavy favorite. Johnny, I mean, is this is, is this a single or are you going to try to beat her? Well, I'm, you know, when I look at the race, who can beat her? And, you know, I go back and I look at the acorn. She was, you know, coming. She, she just finished winning the Oaks. She's moving up. Then there's the coaching club. She does great in that. Then the Travers, a race she probably should have won. And then there's that race in Pennsylvania where she didn't run so good. So, she, But let's just call that maybe being a little tired after running a couple really tough races. So now who can beat her? Who can move up and run a race similar to what she ran races prior to that last? And there's really no one. Uh, the only horse to me that's got an outside shot, and I don't, I only can go by, I haven't seen this horse run. I'm only going by what I'm seeing on, on the form and the sheets is awesome result. Uh, so awesome result could have an outside shot, but this horse does not like to lose. So I, 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 I got to use her as the top pick. Mark. Yeah, I was thinking similarly, uh, you know, She's the best horse. She's on the pace, and uh, it's going to be uh, you know tough for her to. Uh, um, I mean, who's going to challenge her? I think, and just think about like the early part of the race, and like Johnny said, um, it's hard to know too much about horses coming in from Japan. Awesome result. Um, you got to respect a horse that's uh, she's seven for seven, so uh, maybe open the door a little bit. Uh, how could uh, she win? Would well, probably have to be, I think, on the lead and just, uh, um, you know, taking the race to her or just going to the lead and not stopping. So, um, but you know, this is this is a fairly likely winner for me. It's probably the most likely winner of the weekend. How about you, Ed? I'm t- I'm totally against. Uh, don't like her at all. Not using her in the trifecta. Uh, I'm a sheets devotee. And that cotillion was such a step backwards. There is no way I would bet a Philly off that race uh, to rebound to the number it's going to take to win this at four to five. So obviously she can win. I'm not saying that, but at four to five, this just to me is a prime bet against opportunity. Uh, A stat I shared on Twitter, three-year-olds in the distaff, five for 69, negative 77% ROI. If you had, if you just bet every older Philly or mayor since 2004 in the distaff, you'd be ahead. You could bet every four, five, or six year old in the distaff since 2004, and you'd be ahead. Uh, three year olds are a bad bet, and I'm going to play it to continue. And on top, I'll go with speaking of Phillies who don't like to lose, awesome result, seven for seven. Marshall Lorraine got me three years ago at 50 to one. Uh, maybe we can get a little bit back at four to one uh, for from, I guess, not really her compatriot because this one was bad bred in Kentucky, uh, but she's coming from Japan and I'm going to play her to upset one of the heaviest favorites of the weekend. Yeah, she is by justify a horse you might have heard of. So uh, Yasutoshi Ike is the trainer. Takatake, great jockey, kind of the Mike Smith of Japan. I don't know if he's quite as old, but he certainly has the credentials. He will be riding four to one as mentioned, but I'm, I do still like Torpedo Anna. Let me, let me throw this for the, for the panel. Was that a bounce in the cotillion? Ed, you've already said that. No, you don't think so. What about Johnny Mark? What do you think? Did she bounce? Well, I think you could interpret it that way. I th- I like what Ed's saying is if her form's regressing, uh, you don't want it to, you, you don't want to expect it to come back. Right. Uh, the other point is, and he makes a really good point about three-year-old Phillies. Um, they're also not good bets in the Philly mayor sprint. So um, this is a trend uh, or as, as favorites. So this is kind of a trend that uh, is a breeders cup trend as a whole, you know, they're, they're racing against, you know, three-year-olds and they're, they look good and it's, it's a different game. I think the tough thing here is this race doesn't look that deep uh, unless you're a raging sea fan, but um <laughs> 
but I think there's a lot <laughs> to like about awesome result coming in from the from the outside. And uh, so it brings up some good points. I mean, maybe this is a, a place to uh, take a shot. What about you, John? Are you looking at the numbers? Are you looking at a bounce factor on Torpedo, Anna? I mean, it's been such a tough year. I mean, you're going all the way back to the fantasy back in March, the fantasy, the Oaks. I mean, just month after month. And then she runs a, such a tremendous race in the Travers. Why mm. wouldn't she bounce a little bit? But now she's got six weeks off before the next race. And, um, you know, McPeak, if, I would think he's given her quite a bit of rest here and taking it easy for this one race. I, I, I respect what Ed's saying, but um, is there a horse actually that can step up and beat her? Because if she runs the last race, she'll lose. If she goes back to any of those three races prior to that, there's no one in this field that can beat her. Okay. Ed, you want I the agree last with that. Yeah, you want the last word on this, Ed? Yeah, no, I mean, I agree if she runs back to the other three. I, I would not call it a balance, only because those other three were so formful and consistent. It's not like she had the big effort and then bounced. She had a great baseline and just went backwards. So okay. th that's my angle here. And, I mean, look, if Idiomatic were in here and Torpedo Anna ended up the five to two second choice – I'd be, I'd be like, wow, we're getting five to two on Torpedo Anna. But at odds on against an undefeated uh, Philly from Japan, I'm going to gamble. Okay. Let's move ahead to the Breeders' Cup turf. $5 million going a mile and a half. That means three turns here at Del Mar. Three-year-olds end up at 5.01 Eastern time. 13 are entered. Godolphin trainer Charlie Appleby, who has been so successful with a string of horses based at Saratoga over here, he brings 2022 winner Rebels Romance back to this race on the strength of four wins and a third in five starts this year. Five to two on the morning line, Mark. Yeah, uh, Rebels Romance, it, you know, there's a lot to like there. Uh, the price is amazing, but as we know, Char Charlie Appleby has been amazing in the Breeders' Cup. So, got to respect him. I was also looking at Emily Upjohn. Uh, Frankie Dettori's up for John Gosden, and uh, she's winless this year, but I think kind of trending in the right direction. So, those are the two I'm looking at. Ed? Uh, I'm... Swing a little bit here. I, I, I like Grand Sonata's last race a lot. Uh, and I, I've, you know, kind of turned the screws a little bit on horses coming from Kentucky Downs. And, you know, we'll see what Cogburn does. But if, if he falters, maybe Grand Sonata can, can pull the upset and get him on the board. But I, I thought that was a great effort for those who don't remember how Kentucky Downs was playing uh coming from off the pace was was no slouch uh that was it was tough to win from further back and tyler made a great move to get in contention uh you know a little earlier than deep stretch and it worked out and this horse fits at 20 to 1 so grant sonata uh is a horse i'm going to take a shot with and then of the internationals certainly uh rebel romance makes a, a ton of sense luxembourg though 12 to 1 on the line i'm not sure we'll get that uh, but if there were head-to-head -head wagering, maybe in Arizona and DK Horse, uh, and Luxembourg was, you know, tw twice the price as Rebel Romance, uh, I'd be interested in in taking that. I, I think Luxembourg's undervalued here, but Grant Sonata is my upset special. All right, Johnny. In addition to the race, do you want to take Ed's money? And <laughs> I'd, I'd love to put it up to have a chance to take it. Yes, that's um, a whole other podcast. Taking Ed's money. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's the tem uh, yeah <laughs> uh i i do like luxembourg in this race for to get a piece and be close i also like this horse from japan sharir is that how you say it sharir, sharir yeah and then but i Re rebels romance has been so consistent uh one of the most consistent horses in the in all of the readers cup races so uh I think this horse this horse loses if it's a late start or if it you know some excuse gets boxed, but this horse should be right there because he's right there every other race. Shariar, I looked at my Shariar. notes wrong. Shariar, I, I had that wrong. It looks good as well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of pronunciations that look weird, but it's actually easier than you think. JRB is the one I'm looking at. 
the number five horse for Brian Meehan. Sean Levy will be up at four to one. One by a head in the pre-dollar, which I think is actually a, a better bellwether race than a lot of folks might think. This was on a soft soft going at Longchamp, which seems to be nothing but soft going every year on Arc Day anymore. But this is also a horse that won on good going at Royal Ascot in the Hampton Court. So uh, four to one, yeah, might be a little lower than I would want. Well, of course it is, but I think JRB, uh, I'll keep an eye on the tote board there and hope that one goes a little bit longer. Okay, let's get to the big one, which is uh, right in the middle of the card. As I mentioned before, this will be the last race in the first pick five and the first race in the late pick five. This is the $7 million Breeders' Cup Classic, the traditional mile and a quarter for three-year-olds and up. It'll be at 541 Eastern time. If you're wondering why, it's because NBC has a Big Ten football contract that comes into play here and so this race has got to get done before that game goes on the air somebody can tell me what game it is uh 14 are entered plus and also eligible and you got stars from three different continents in this one that are getting talked about but whether any of the three will win this is what we're going to discuss city of troy five to two morning line favorite three group one wins in europe this year but has never raced on dirt Hadn't even trained on it until showing up over here. Fierceness at three to one. One last year's juvenile has grade one wins in the Florida Derby and Travers, but was 15th in the Kentucky Derby. And there's Forever Young, who was a nose and a nose for winning the Kentucky Derby after winning the UAE Derby, which would have been something that would have made me loud, loud wrong. So uh, how does his form from the Kentucky Derby translate? coming into this race. So those are the three big stars, at least coming in from three different directions. Let's see what our guys think now. Ed, what do you think on the Breeders' Cup Classic? Well, I love the the showdown among three-year-olds from three different countries. That's awesome. Uh, but I actually like an older horse to upset the uh, uh, apple cart. Ushba Tesoro uh, was who, I don't know what I thought he'd be, uh, name wise but i was very bullish on him and then he was second to senor buscador and then laurel river whatever that was but tesoro was never beating him that day uh and then a second in, in the prep for this but this is a horse who can get 10 furlongs he's comfortably going to be no uh worse than the fourth choice so i think i'm going to get the right price and uh i, I picked him on top I, those who have read fair odds over the last month no, I see fierce, fierceness is the most likely winner. I just don't think the value is going to be there, even with City of Troy being over bet. Uh, so Ushba Tesoro is going to be my pick. And City of Troy is going to be my toss among the horses taking money. I, I just think it, it's a bridge too far. I mean, the, the talent is obviously there, but first time dirt as the favorite against these, uh, I just got to be against. All right, Mark. Yeah, I'm still scratching my head on this one, and I think I'm going to look at see how the track's playing quite a bit. I just don't know that there's that much separating these. Uh, like Ed said, you know, you can't really take that price on City of Troy. And, uh, you know, with fierceness, I was dead set against him for the Derby. Uh, you know, obviously he did a lot better in the summer, and, uh, you know, he might be in a good spot on the pace. The other thing that, you know, I'm having tr trouble with is the last time uh, we did the Breeders' Cup Classic at Del Mar, I bet a bunch of closers and they did not get a sniff. So um, that's why I want to kind of see how the track's playing. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it, it's great to have 14 horses in this race. It's wide open. There's a lot of uh, places to go. Um, I do like Sierra Leone to hit the board because he always does. Um, so I think there's an option. Uh, and I think Ed's on the right track with Ushba Tesoro. I think he can hit the board as well. Uh, still trying to search for the winner. So I guess right now I'm I'm probably looking at fierceness, but I want to see how the track plays and uh and you know forever young perhaps if the if the track uh, is allowing closers to get up, then you know, I would throw him in as well. Johnny in in the futures over in Europe, City of Troy has taken a lot of money. And so is that what has translated for him to be the favorite? Because he could win the race, but to me, I don't think he deserves favoritism here. Um, I agree. The right. 
like in the the horse that I have not made a dollar on is fierceness. And <laughs> the reason is because fierceness had this tendency to have a good one and a bad one, but he's put really two really good ones together. And those two good ones, there is no other horse in this race that could match those numbers. And so if fierceness has grown a little bit more and he's coming back uh, with another good one, he's your logical winner. Sierra Leone, I he has taken a lot of my money. Um, and But his numbers are still good. And I'm with Mark. I mean, you, when you bet Sierra Leone, you have to know how to track his playing because if speed's holding up and closers can't close, this horse has no chance. Uh, he just waits too long. Now, the, the thing I always look at with Sierra Leone is that Gaff Leone was riding him, was winning on him, and since Pratt's taken over <laughs> He, he, as great of a rider he is, just not can't win on this horse. And horse guys that don't know horses well will say, well, why don't you just move this horse a little bit earlier? I want to try something different. The horse just can't do anything different. That's his style, and that's what he has to do. Uh, at 12 to 1, I could get all my money back here, guys, on one shot. <laughs> so uh, yeah. I'll certainly be taking a, a, a good look at, at Sierra Leone. A couple outsider to me could be an Arthur's ride. Could Arthur's ride go to the lead, steal this race? Nobody paying attention to him because his race is prior to that last jockey gold cup was, was much, they were much better. I, I like Arthur's ride a lot here. I like, I like the fact that he's four. I think the three-year-olds look three-year-olds get, if you get nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds out in a schoolyard, the 10-year-olds are going to beat the nine-year-olds. This is kind of, I mean, to me, all things being equal, all right, maybe all things aren't equal. Well, it's a tap it. It's Mott. Draw a line through the Jockey Club Gold Cup. I, I'm liking Arthur's ride. And Johnny, if you could book a horse to lose, City of Troy. Ryan Moore, 0 for dirt in the United States. Aiden O'Brien, 1 for dirt in Breeders' Cup races and hasn't won a Breeders' Cup race on dirt here since 2000. I, listen, I just think you, you don't take a horse who you put on dirt and race him for the first time on dirt in a $7 million race after training him on turf and synthetic. So uh, you know, in, so in a 14 horse field, we, we've, we've seen this movie before. Yes. You know, yeah. he, they've brought in <laughs> favorites before. It's, it's not a good bet. Um, I, I just want to add too, like in races like this, a lot of times I'm trying to look for who, uh, you know, who, who's been against it, who's, you know, had things their way, uh, you know, talking about Sierra Leone, I, I think he's kind of been against it. You know, the Derby was kind of a setup. Uh, okay. But the Belmont with Dornock, he didn't have a chance to win that coming off the pace. The Jim Dandy, Malinath at Saratoga, no shot for a horse like that. And the Travers, I don't think it really played out for him. And the, the track was a little speed that day. So this is a horse. If, the, if the track is closing, you know, like Tony said, maybe we get all get our money back. That would be nuts. But uh, but I think he's a he's a great play for the exactos and tries. Hey Mark, one thing I'll add to that is is Pratt, as good of a rider he is, has not rode this horse very well. He he's made some mistakes on this horse. He's been inside when he should have been outside. He was outside when he should have been in. I mean, he's he's trying to figure it out too. So yeah, we'll see. And what about Tappet Trice? You were a fan once. I yeah. The the numbers just haven't come back quick enough. I mean that Briss is solid one oh two, uh, but but the Ragazin isn't there. Uh of the thirty to ones though, I, I'm actually glad Pyrenees drew in. I, I think he uh he could get a slice of this at a big number. I, I really like that horse. I, uh, this if he doesn't get a slice, how about this? How about he uh he gets a really bad trip and wins the Clark at twelve to one? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Um, I'll take that. And, and then one other thought. Uh, the uh, do, do, do. oh, Derma. So Derma runs a huge second to White Barrio last year, right? And uh, I think a lot of people would be on this horse. He's 20 to 1, but just looking at, you know, fifth in Maidan uh, or fifth in, in Saudi Arabia, sixth in Dubai, and a distant fifth in his prep race, um, it's hard to get excited about coming in yeah. there. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's uh, throw me something. There's just I'll, there's I'll, no rate. There's no race this year that 
you're like, oh, we just need that race. I mean, you right. have to go back to the Breeders' Cup last year, which at least that was here, but yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, guys, one, one last comment before we leave this race. The horse next, he's won like seven in a row and he's crushed them. I mean, not even close. Um, what's everybody's opinion on where he is going to be during this race? I mean, what's is he a contender here, or is he just is he up against it, as Mark would say? I think the distance is wrong, let alone the surface. But that's my thought. Yeah, he's up. I think he's up against it. I think he's beating. He's it's such a great story. So much fun to watch. He's beating, you know, grade three horses. And I, I mean, I, I love that they're they're going here, but I feel like they got talked into this one. Yeah, it's kind for me. It's a sort of trust the trainer. Like the the Jockey Club Gold Cup was the perfect opportunity to get ten furlongs on dirt. Uh, granted, against some of these, and you know, find out what you got, and then you know, maybe even make a horse of the year play. You win a race like that, and then win the classic. Which he still, if he won the classic, probably would get some horse of the year talk. But the, sure. the the fact that Cowens was just so against running this horse against Grade One animals all year when there was chances for lesser competition than this. Now he draws the 14. Uh, you know, at least there's only one finish line to worry about at Del Mar, but I don't think it's going to matter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Come on now. You didn't lose any money on that one. Oh, God. I didn't. Comments, comments down there. I, not that I've ever gotten anything on that subject. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on, if we might. $2 million Breeders' Cup Philly and Mare Turf. Uh, this one uh, for three and up, 625 Eastern time. 13 are in the field. I have it written down as a mile and a quarter. That's not right. It's just a mile and three eighths, isn't it? Yep. Uh, fourth time that seven-year-old warlike goddess is trying to win a Breeders' Cup race. Uh, she comes in off second place results in the Flower Bowl and the Joe Hirsch Turf Classic. Uh, I might add here, because it has been a talking point, Chad Brown did not put any horses in this race because he doesn't want to see a mile and three eighths going three turns in what would effectively be a turf bull ring. So be that as it may. But uh, amid all this, a, a flawed warlike goddess, five to two on the morning line. Uh, Mark, let's start with you. Uh, I'm going to look at the three year old Philly, uh, unless I do have stats to recommend against, but uh, I like Cinderella. <laughs> no, not in turn. I like Cinderella's dream in here. I thought the the race in the, the Saratoga Oaks was great. Just sat back on a slow pace and just inhaled them. Um, and then the form out of that race has been pretty decent. And, uh, um, you know, again, we know what Appleby has done and, uh, I don't know what kind of price you get in here. Four to one sounds good to me. I was also looking at content, uh, one of the Aiden O'Brien runners, but, uh, I really like Cinderella's dream and, uh, see what she's, I mean, she's six for seven. So I guess it's not going to be a big price. Johnny. This is a race where I think you cash a nice ticket here. Nice, exact, a nice try ticket. Uh, I'm looking at Moore as my top choice, um, but I'm also going to use a horse named Sopranos, 20 to 1. I think that horse is getting better. Uh, Didia, I'm also going to use. He's 12 to 1. She's 12 to 1. And full count Felicia, 12 to 1. So this is not a great race. I mean, these there's no really great horse in this race like there has been in the past. So to me, one of the most wide open races of the day. Ed? Yeah, I think that Warlike Goddess being the favorite off the year she's had, which I mean, we'd all love to own a horse that has that kind of year. But as far as Breeders' Cup favorites go, we've seen a lot better resumes. Uh, I'm almost complete lockstep with Johnny. Uh, you know, Moira is a personal favorite, uh, so I, I'm I'm glad that I landed on her organically. Uh, but I'll be thrilled as a fan. Uh, I was there for her at the time, Queen's Plate. Uh, it was one of the most electrifying runs I've seen live. So uh, I'm a fan and think she can turn the, the tables on her stable mate. But that EP Taylor, like that, you know, looking at the brisk pace ratings, that was not just full count Felicia getting a slow pace. She absolutely blitzed them. And when you're up by 14 in a grade one race, you're running fast. That's not right. her going slow and everyone was out of touch. Uh, I have to think the plan is going to be similar with the Rod Ortiz up from post two, uh, just 
take it to him going three turns. So I'm not dismissing her at 12 to one. And and I think Soprano, one of those, if she had won the QE two and she was eight to one in here, eh, whatever, but 20 to one, she has races to run back to that uh, can compete with these. So uh, Johnny, you know, the four he mentioned, I'm on with three of them and more is my top pick. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking full count Felicia uh, as well. I think that like we were talking about that EP Taylor, my fear would be the extra furlong here. Uh, if you look at the, how she has. And the extra come, turn. And the, and the extra turn, although the extra turn might actually work in her favor. Maybe she'll find some energy coming into that uh, particular spot as opposed to the long straight, but you know, I it's 12 to one. I think uh, that's, that's the attractive part for me and uh, former Brittany Russell trainee who's now with Kevin Attard. Uh, if this race were in Canada, I'd be even more uh, faithful <laughs> in that, but uh, it's not, it's a little ways away. All right, let's get to the Breeders' Cup Sprint. Six furlongs, three and up, 7.05 Eastern. There are 11 drawn into this $2 million race. Brad Cox, we haven't mentioned his name much yet. Four-year-old gelding federal judge is in his barn. The three-to-one morning line favorite won the Phoenix to go two for two at six furlongs at this distance. Rudolph Brisse has been training Mulligan uh, up from the four-go win 10 weeks ago. So two different strategies for these two. As I mentioned, federal judge three-to-one. Mulligan is seven-to-two. Johnny, you can go ahead and tackle the sprint first. Sure. Uh, Mulliken is my top choice because I like the consistency of this horse. A winner of four in a row. Uh, No reason not to get the fifth here. So the only thing I don't like is there's speed by Mulliken. There's there's also speed by, uh, you know, the favorites. So federal judge. So I don't know how that all works out, but that's a little scary to me. A couple of horses I do like underneath. I like uh, Nakatomi underneath. I also like Ben Tornato underneath that, that 30 to one shot. I think that's a horse that could also get a piece. Ed? I like straight no chaser. And, you know, Johnny did mention the the speed in here, but th- this one, you know, two back, which was off the long layoff, ran out of gas. But otherwise, uh, this thing doesn't know when to stop uh, when you look at his wins. And that was awesome in the the Santa Anita, the the local prep for this. And as I said, when we talked about the Philly and Mare Sprint, of the three uh, California-based uh, Breeders' Cup winners at Del Mar, two were in sprint races. So uh, kind of kind of fits that California speed mold of what it takes to win out there. Uh, five to one's the right price, and I, I think the Japan horse is usable here. Uh, kind of a wild card, but. I know people were excited by what this one did in Korea and, you know, we know can ship into Saudi Arabia and UAE and Korea and now the U S so uh, remake it eight to one, you know, may- maybe a fun one to include underneath or with whoever else you like, but straight no chase on top for me. Mark. There's so much speed in this race. Uh, I've got to go with the closers and uh, there's not a lot to choose from. It's uh, Nakatomi six to Nakatomi six to one, Gun Pilot at twenty to one, and the Japanese horse Meta Max at twenty to one. So I'm gonna go with those three. Uh, I'm really interested in Meta Max coming in from Japan, uh, coming off it a little bit, pressing or or closing, and uh, I just I can't see with all the speed the this race not coming off it. I'm going to go the other direction. I'm going to stay with straight no chaser. I guess I'm not alone in the room for this one, but I just keep seeing him extending his lead in the races that uh, he has won. Five-year-old by Spitzer for Dan Blacker and Johnny Velasquez up. And I like it's JV on a front runner. Listen, JV can win on a lot of style horses, but when he's on a front runner, that that really is a, a powerful combination. So I'm leaning in that direction and hoping I get every bit. Uh, of the five to one odds on the morning line. By the way, speaking of the morning line, I wanted to throw this in. Uh, David Aragona had a, a an ex post uh, about the classic, talking about how it's difficult to make morning lines. And remember, we don't have the same morning line maker in Southern California anymore, uh, with John White having retired. So there, there's sort of a movement of the deck chairs here. But the prediction on this classic certainly was that uh, in his case, David thought Forever Young might wind up being the slight favorite. So how are you guys looking at the morning line as much for this Breeders' Cup as you might have for previous Breeders' Cup, particularly with the change in the morning line rider? 
Uh, I mean, I like that the points wise, it added up to most races, 127, 128. Uh, and the, the predecessor was, was want to go over 135 and even into mm-hmm. the 140s. So from a actual distribution of, of odds, I, I think it gives the better, a better sense for how these races can actually be bet. Um, I would say I look at it and plug for HRN, but more as an academic, uh, you know, it's a job I hope we do as a company one day for more tracks than we do currently. So I'm always looking at the line and how people do it and what makes it good or bad. Okay. Johnny or Mark, do you have a, I didn't didn't look at the early at the morning line at all for these races because I knew we were going to do this podcast on today, Tuesday, and we had very limited time. So I started a lot earlier. So I saw the morning line until yesterday, first time. Okay. Mark, Mark, what about you? I would just say that these races, most of them are so deep that uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of it is trying to, to get a hold on the race and, and trying to find the winners and the contenders and not, you know, there's money to be made almost in every case. Now, if you're between, you know, City of Troy and Fierceness and, you know, that's important because, you know, you might be thinking three to one and you're going to get eight to five, um, you know, does the line have it right? You know, that's important. But a lot of these, if you're on, you know, Five to one, ten to ones, it doesn't even matter, you know. Okay. The the other thing is if you're a multi race player and you're thinking, oh, City of Troy is three to one and fierceness is going to be seven to two or five to two, and you're using them both, it really doesn't matter what their win odds are if that you're using them both. Uh t- to me, you want to worry about odds when you're actually making decisions of not using someone, playing against a short price. If you're just putting them all in the same bucket. Uh, to me, it's less important, especially among the, the favorites. What I don't know is whether Jeff Siegel, who's doing morning lines up at Santa Anita, is doing so for the Breeders' Cup or for Del Mar. I should know that. He is. Okay, it's okay. Siegel. so it is yeah. It is Jeff. All right. Uh, Breeders' Cup mile. We got two more here, both at a mile, and the Breeders' Cup mile on the turf. And this will be two turns, three-year-olds and up, 745 Eastern time on Saturday. A dozen are entered. Charlie Appleby trains Godolphin three-year-old Notable Speech, the seven-to-two program favorite, who won two Group Ones this year in Europe. The top U.S. hope, Carl Spackler, six-to-one, a four-year-old trained by Chad Brown, has two Grade One wins. Here we are talking about the morning line. Mark, would you agree with six-to-one on Carl Spackler? I mean, that horse seven for 10 is pretty strong. Um, it'd probably come down from that, I think, a little bit. But, yeah. uh, um, you know, again, I think like that, that's a case where, you know, if that's your horse and you're right, I mean, I'm not going to complain if I get nine to two and, you know, maybe get a little more. I don't know. Maybe I tipped um, my hand there, didn't I? <laughs> what, that you're going to bet him and you're going to complain when he wins at nine to two? <laughs> you know me so well. You know me so well. <laughs> well, otherwise you wouldn't have anything to complain about. So, right. well, yeah, well, I'd find something. Uh, but I mean, well, the good thing with Breeders' Cup, right? We, you know, we haven't talked about all the odds drops uh, that are seem to get worse and worse. But uh, there's so much money in the pool in Breeders' Cup that uh, you know that doesn't seem like point. it's really a factor. So that's nice for two days. Anyway, but as far as the miles concerned, do you any? Uh, I interrupted your flow there. I mean, it, for me, it's tough to go against Appleby. So I think, you know, notable speech at seven to two is interesting. I think that's one where, you know, if it's pounded down or if he's winning all weekend, uh, that becomes less attractive. Uh, the others I was interested in was the one, uh, Ramatel, I don't know, Ram- uh, Diego Velasquez, the four for Aiden O'Brien. Um, Cherie DeVoe seems like she's been red hot, you know, said she's doing really well. Um, you know, this more than looks, the eights run second to Carl Spackler twice in a row uh, in a wide open race that could have more pace. I think this horse could be interesting to hit the board. And then uh, obviously Joe Hounds is coming in. So there's, I'm mentioning five, but uh, notable speech, my top choice. Okay. Rama Twell was correct, by the way, on that, on the number one. Ed? Uh, I'm, I'm swinging again. Uh, Mark mentioned the horse I like best more than looks. A uh, little bit of Charlie Brown and Lucy with the football. Uh, definitely a, a cult. People think, oh, this is the time and, you know, runs on for second. But, you know, we're not talking about three to one in a race at Keeneland or Saratoga. 
we're talking about 20 to one of, of a horse who fits. I mean, that the length behind Carl Spackler and you're getting three times the price. Uh, so I'm uh, more than looks uh, my top pick and, and I'm going to use uh, numbers two and three as well. Uh, Irad ends up on chili flag for Chad, a, a mayor. He's won this race uh, before with the uh, beaten males. Uh, and I think she fits it at a big number and geoglyph uh from japan uh, i think there's two in here from japan I, I do prefer this one uh you know it's it's hard to know how accurate rag is in are I, I definitely don't think i'm going out on a limb to say that their numbers aren't uh as efficacious in the land of the rising sun as they are in america but i do know uh that they put a lot into you know trying to at least match it up as best they can and i'm not using the numbers to say, oh, that means this horse can win, but I am comfortable to say he fits. And at 20 to one, he fits is good enough for me. Johnny? There's only three horses that I have marked right now. I mean, I, I'm i take. I'm certainly going to take a, a harder look as we get closer, but Johannes is my top pick, followed really closely by Carl Spackler, and then the other horse is more than look. So they're the only three I actually have marked at this time. Okay. Carl Spackler, like I said, I, uh, and, and, uh, if the odds aren't right, if he doesn't win, if he, you know, if I, if I don't like the morning line, I, I got, I got ammo to complain. Finally, the million dollar breeders cup dirt mile. It'll be at eight twenty five Eastern time. The full field of 14 is entered to go this two turn mile on the main track, three year olds and up national treasure is injured. And so that takes a little starch out of the race. Three-year-old domestic product, the seven-to-two morning line favorite, won the Allen Jerkins Memorial last out, but that was on August 24th. So here's another 10-week train up in this case. Skippy Longstrocking drew wide, four to one on the morning line, three graded stakes victories this year, and was second of four, four in the Woodward last out. Ed. I like Mufasa. Uh I don't think we're going to get 12 to one. I mean, this horse has been favored in nine <laughs> straight races, uh, including a, a grade three last out. So yeah, this, this is a step up and it's 14 horses instead of six, but the numbers are there. Uh, the style is there. Um, the outside post I'd say isn't great. I mean, the, it's a two turn mile at Del Mar. So definitely position is going to be important, but this horse sits and kicks uh and you know as long as he doesn't end up totally marooned uh i think he gets first run on whoever's in the lead and it's going to be awfully tough to catch uh triple digit late pace rating from brisnet tells me he can motor home uh quickly uh after pressing a fast pace and 12 to 1 on the 12 mufasa uh i love him johnny i also like mufasa to move mufasa to be in the mix. He's one of the ones I am going to be using. My top pick is domestic product. And the reason is because they figured out now that domestic product is not a mile and a quarter horse. He's not even a mile and a 16th horse. He's a, he's a, he's a sprinter. That's what he is. He can go a mile. And they figured that out now. And um, he's had no problem with that distance. That's been his best two races and he's improving. So um he is uh, my best bet for this race. Mark? Yeah. Uh, got a long shot here that I really love. Um, I don't know if he can win, but uh, Tumbarumba uh, is a horse that's just been fighting all year. Uh, if you remember Pegasus Day, uh, uh, he got up for a nice win at 8-1. to one. Uh, It's just been kind of battling all year. Uh, I think his last two at Churchill aren't really indicative. Um and June 30th, at the end of the Churchill meet, the uh, outside was good. The inside was bad. And uh, he got beat that day by Kelly Ostro. Uh, and then he came back in the slop and kind of a throwout race last time. But uh, the other interesting thing is about this horse is he's been doing well at a mile. Uh, so he's kind of a miler. Um, but he's basically been going a one-turn mile. So I think it, it, at Gulfstream, at Churchill, uh, at Ellis. And so he's got very... Uh, doesn't have a two-turn mile um he's got a couple two-turn mile and ace where he was a second and a third um and a mile 16th he was second at Gulfstream. so uh i just think he there's so much speed in this race there's a horse that can sit 
you know, maybe sit just a couple links off it and, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, that's my plan for Saez that, that, that Saez doesn't go on this horse, but if he can sit off it, I think he can have some punch. Um, and, uh, some prices I would play him underneath is the four Katona. I would play him under domestic product. Like Johnny said, there's a lot of th- good things I like about him. If this ends up being domestic products jam, obviously, uh, based on his numbers, he would be, uh, one to consider and then Mufasa I, I want to protect with as well because it's a little there's a lot of upside to that horse but uh I'm really looking for Tumbarama to hit hit the exact uh, trifecta and, and play some win money not liking nine to two for Muth because I, I think here at Del Mar the prices will come down for a Baffert horse although let's see how Baffert does this weekend since this is late in the Saturday card that could change things, but I also am going to try and draw a line through the California crown and the disappointing performance coming up last and empty in that race. Because if you look at how this horse is trained, this is the old Baffert tightening the horse 47 and two for a half 59 and two, and then 59 for a pair of a five uh, furlong workouts. So I'm going to go with Muth, but hope, uh, I hope I'm getting every bit of nine to two, but hmm. not that optimistic. Hey, we made it through now. How about best bets from each of our hardcore handicappers? I'm going to ask them for those in just a moment. I'm going to ask you, Ed DeRosa, to uh, offer up a little plug for Horse Racing Nation. Yeah, well, uh, I was actually uh, just kind of spot reading Andy Byers' book, My $50,000 Year at the Races. And one thing that stuck out to me uh, is a passage uh, about something that really – changed his approach for the better as he realized stick to your strengths as a handicapper and bet those edges. And I bring that up because I think I have my strengths and I know that David Levitch, the paddock prince has his strengths. And when I look at his analysis and picks for uh, big events or Churchill, et cetera, uh, I know that he's bringing a little different perspective than maybe I employ. And to me, that is the value of, of those types of sheets. Now, if you just want picks, he's got you covered. He'll have every race, and you can look at his numbers and go from there. But if you like handicapping, as we all do, we've spent an hour talking about it, that extra, to me, insight and analysis that David brings with his report uh, is great for big events like this because it can either bolster your opinion on something, maybe turn you on to a long shot to use with a long shot you like, Uh, or you can disagree and and move on. But either way, it's like having a conversation, uh, and it's a great product every day, but especially for Breeders' Cup. Go to picks.horseracingnation.com. When you're there, you'll see under the featured section, Breeders' Cup Special, the Paddock Prince. You can get the package for the two big days of racing here at Del Mar for only $29. Good price to check out the product, and if it works for you, we're pretty sure you'll come back again and you'll find a price plan that suits you. If you're an everyday player, a weekend player, play big race, whatever they may be, uh, David will have that for you. And by the way, David will be on the regular episode Friday of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod, but you can catch what he has to write about the Breeders' Cup right now by going to picks.horseracingnation.com. The Paddock Prince Breeders' Cup special for $29 at picks. P-I-C-K-S. Picks. HorseracingNation.com. Past performances heard on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod are provided by Brisnet, the only place where you can find Kieran's speed points, the easy way to map the pace in any race. Find out more for yourself and get full past performances for the Friday and Saturday Breeders' Cup cards here at Del Mar. Go to Brisnet.com. I also have this for you, an invitation to check out the Friday episode of the Ron Flatter Racing Pod from here at Del Mar. You'll hear from FanDuel TV's Mike Joyce, plus plenty of guests from around the track and from around the stables, including Hall of Fame trainer D. Wayne Lucas. I mentioned David Levitch, too, and uh, others to be determined as soon as I go face-to-face with them and they avoid running away from me. So that's going to be Friday here on the Ron Flatter Racing Pod. Subscribe free at Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get podcasts, or check it out in the podcast section at horseracingnation.com. We thank you for being along for this long, long, it's always a long podcast. We know you get a lot of good information out of it. And now you're going to get best bets. And we start with the man from DraftKings Sportsbook and DK Horse, Johnny Avello. 
Well, Ron, there's two ways to look at best bets. There's a horse who's most likely to win and who's your best value play. Uh, so I the, mo the horse to me most likely to win is Cogburn. Uh, so I won't give that a best bet because he's going to be such a short price. But I think my value play of the day would be Mora. Okay. Looking at Moira. That's uh, Philly and Mare Turf, right? Yep. Okay. Ed DeRosa, he of fair odds, and he of his best bet for Breeders' Cup 2024. I'll, I'll take a, a page out of Johnny's template and say most likely winner of Lake Victoria. I'd be happy to play her at uh, anything over even money. Uh, and then best bet-wise, uh, I'm going to sort of do a package deal with the Japanese horses, and the three I'm going to mention are all going to be more than two to one. So if any of the three win, you'll be ahead. For the day and if all three win uh we'll have to treat ourselves to something special because it'll be a really good weekend for me uh but american bikini in the juvenile phillies awesome result in the distaff and ushba tesoro in the classic uh i think are a, a three-headed monster uh that could give godzilla a run for his money japan's loaded and those are the three i like and they're all going to be an overlay Here's the man who put this whole thing together, Horse Racing Nation, and he's also advanced, as I mentioned, AI and the analytics that come from that. Mark Midland, your best bet for the Breeders' Cup. Uh, best bet to win as far as a bet I would make, uh, not just uh, most likely winner. I, I like Cinderella's dream in the Philly Mare turf quite a bit. And uh, best bet in terms of value, uh, Tumbarumba. I just the, Every time I look at his PPs, other than Slop, I don't think he's a he's not finished uh, more than you know on one or within a length in the last ten races, and uh, um, I'm hoping this one uh, two turn miles is ball game. For me, my best bet, I guess I'm going to use as uh, a value play Arthur's Ride in the Breeders' Cup Classic, and I'm going to try and ride him and see if we can draw that line through his last race and really build on that allowance win and then the Whitney and get 15 to one. So uh, let's put it this way. If it comes through, that really would be <laughs> my best bet. So hopefully yours come through too, as you play the Breeders' Cup. Thank yous again to Mark Midland, Ed DeRosa, and Johnny Avello. A reminder about my regular episode coming up on Friday from here at Del Mar. Until then, this is Ron Flatter. I don't know what we are fighting for, but I know that they don't want us.